Hi, good afternoon. Uh, an excellent presentation by RK. So the main theme in, you know, the presentations this morning, you've seen Google talk about, you know, GPUs, you know, TPUs. Then we've had the uh, Lightwire uh, discussion about optics and then, you know, RK talking about a new way to think about uh, accelerators. Um, we um, at Broadcom kind of really subscribe to um, all of this, right? And, and there's different ways that the exact same data was presented over the course of this morning. Uh, but the, you know, the summary of this is over the next five years or so, there's about 124 gigawatts of additional capacity that is supposed to be brought online to handle all the compute needs which are expected to happen. Now, to put that in the context, 124 uh, gigawatts, each gigawatt is roughly about 600,000 GPUs, the most advanced GPUs which are available today. So if you take 124 multiplied by 0.6, you get to just about 70 plus million GPUs to be deployed, additional GPUs slash XPUs to be deployed over the course of the next, you know, five plus years, right? Now, when you're going at that kind of a scale, one of the things that's going to start happening, and you're already seeing that, you know, there were discussions about TPUs this morning, there's discussions on Tensodyne and so on and so forth. People are fundamentally looking at, you can't just take a general purpose, you know, graphics processor, right? Instead, you start to actually think about very, you know, um, specifically optimized, you know, accelerators, which I will generically refer to as XPUs as we go through the rest of this, you know, session of mine. And the attempt here is to make sure that you're able to get the lowest cost per token, the lowest power per token, the lowest cost per token, by rethinking some of the fundamental architecture of the chip itself. And as you can see, there's multiple different, you know, devices or accelerators being built by different companies. All of them have a certain workload that they're optimizing around. And then the idea is that they are able to get a better, you know, performance per given dollar or given, you know, watt of power. Now, when you think about it, even any one, you know, XPU is not large enough to run the workload. And that was kind of what you heard through mul multiple presentations. And what is really needed is to be able to cluster many of these. Sometimes it's a thousand, you know, it's 10,000, a hundred thousand plus of these to work together as if it's a single large system. Why? Because if you think about it, the maximum size of a chip that you can build today in a foundry is about 800 millimeter square. Then you can put them on an interposer, connect multiple of them, sometimes it's six, eight, or so on and so forth. You're talking about a couple of thousand millimeter square, but they're still not sufficient to run these large language models. So you really have to put together a very large cluster of many individual devices, all acting as if they're one large supercomputer. Right? When you have something like that, one large supercomputer that's built from many smaller CPUs, GPUs, XPUs, network plays an extremely important role. About a couple of years ago, the team from Meta presented at OCP that said, if you have 100,000, you know, XPUs, you've probably spent three to four billion dollars on the XPUs itself. You probably spend a couple of hundred million dollars on the networking. But what ends up happening is these XPUs are sitting idle anywhere from 20 to 50 percent of the time, waiting for the data to traverse the network. Right. So a large amount of compute is sitting idle, just waiting for the data to shuffle through the network. And the network plays an extremely important role. And by the way, this is a picture from the early 2000s of Google's data centers. Right. When Google started to build their search, it is one of the largest distributed computing systems in the world. They didn't take the most expensive CPU that was out there, but instead, they took the CPU that offered the best performance per watt or the best performance per a dollar. And then they had these just built out over very large data centers or many of these data centers. And all these, you know, blue, yellow lines that you, uh, wires that you see there are simple Ethernet cables. So you essentially are building the world's largest distributed systems by connecting them over a network that is reliable, that's fast, and more importantly, it's open 
that you can have multiple vendors, you know, provide you the uh, network with. So with that kind of as a context, that this is the world's, you know, some of the largest, you know, supercomputers being built, you say, well, what is that size of the supercomputer? Part of the discussion this morning was, well, you could use a supercomputer or a rack, and the rack is some multiples of 10, you know, XPUs, right? Could be, you know, 30, 60, 70, or so on and so forth. Or is it across multiple, you know, racks? Why should you be constrained to a some number that's less than 100 when these models actually would ideally like to have one super large computer, which could be hundreds, if not thousands, all scaling up? So, but today's constraints are such that you have a rack of about 72 or less, and then you have many of these racks tied together, and that's kind of what's called a scale out, which is going beyond one rack is scale out. And oftentimes what you find out is while you aspire to have a gigawatt data center or a couple of gigawatt data centers, these are all things that are happening or going to happen in the future. The reality is there's a lot of many 10 plus megawatt data centers that are sitting available that you can essentially take those collection of many 10 megawatt data centers. When I say 10, I'm talking about 20s, 30s, 50s, you know, less than 100. And you want to be able to group them to act as if they're one large cluster. And that's what we call scale out across, right? So when we're thinking about this, essentially we're saying, look, we want to build large supercomputers. It's no longer one GPU or XPU, it's many tens, hundreds, thousands, and, you know, hundreds of thousands of these, all operating as one large system. To do this, you say first, okay, why do you need to even need the, you know, scale up? Let me just kind of try to, you know, step back a little bit and say what's exactly happening and what's the role of the network. Picture here shows an XPU, and today the XPUs have about four HBMs attached to them. Each of the HBM is today HBM3, which has about 9.6 terabits per second bandwidth. So if you do the math, an XPU has roughly about 40 terabits of HBM bandwidth that is attached to it. The next generation of XPUs will have about 8 HBMs. Each of those HBMs are HBM4Es each of which are driving over, if you look at it, about 12.8 terabits. So 8 times 12, you're talking about 100 terabits. So these XPUs have 100 terabits of bandwidth per second HPM attached to this. Now, when you have two XPUs that you want to have them talk to each other, whether it's 272, 144, you want to take at least a reasonable fraction of that 100 terabits per second bandwidth that each one has an HPM attached to it, and shared across multiple XPUs. So effectively what's happening is the scale of bandwidth is going to no longer be, you know, a couple of hundred gigabits, but it's going to be many terabits, 10 plus, up to 20 terabits. And there was actually a presentation that was done by uh, one of the hyperscalers that postulated that soon it'll be in many, you know, 50 plus terabits of IO coming out of one XPU. Just to give you some context, Today, a CPU, even in a large cloud data center, probably has a 50 gigabits of bandwidth coming out of it from the NIC. You're pushing it if you get to 100. Now you're talking about these XPUs having 10 plus terabits, right? Even if you're 100, you know, gigabits today for CPU, you know, 10 plus terabits is 100 times that bandwidth coming out of each XPU. So there's a lot of bandwidth that's coming out of, you know, these XPUs that need to be connected. So that's a lot of bandwidth. Number two, when you're essentially having this memory sharing happening across these XPUs, you want to make sure that the data transfer is very efficient. That means that the network that's connecting these different XPUs, you don't want to add a lot of overhead to shuffle a little bit of data across. So how do you make sure that the uh, overhead is minimized? And lastly, but not the least, you want that network to be reliable because the last thing you want is packets being dropped and spending a lot of time trying to troubleshoot or going back to the last known checkpoint state. When you think about all of these and you say, okay, what's the most reliable way to build this network? We believe it's Ethernet. And not only do we believe it's Ethernet, it's actually all products going to be based on Ethernet. Today, the alternate technologies are 
you know, proprietary ones, right? Whether you call it NVLink or something else. And they have their own set of challenges. But the most beautiful thing about Ethernet is the following. If you are somebody who's building an XPU, which is you're a large hyperscaler, you're building your own ship, and you know what you're going to do with that XPU architecture. You do not want a third-party specification to dictate to you exactly how the XPU is going to handle transactions because a lot of them have their own secret sauce. They want to move at their own pace, okay? Now, the beauty of Ethernet is it actually decouples how the transactions are managed or the memory, you know, trans, you know, um, uh, transfers are managed in the XPU from what happens at the network layer. No other alternate technologies for scale up actually do that. They try to define to you the entire stack. And trust me, when you're a large hyperscaler and you are planning on building a lot of your own XPUs, generation one, two, three, and four, the last thing you want is a common specification or a specification that's controlled by somebody else that's going to limit the pace at which you're going to be able to move. And the nice thing about the Ethernet is it's a very cleanly defined format. It says, look, this is the Ethernet header. By the way, there's some enhancements you can make to Ethernet. And these enhancements to Ethernet, by the way, that are being discussed are all, conf you know, uh, basically conforming to existing specifications. It's an 802.3 specification that exists on Ethernet. And then there's this consortium called the Ultra Ethernet that specified link layer, you know, reliability uh, specification as well as credit-based flow control. 